Pull of Menaka from Fiji. As leaders, it is our duty to deliver infrastructure our people can count on. Schools, roads, bridges, hospitals, and systems that supply clean water. Sanitation and electric power are among the most basic building blocks of human progress, laying the foundation for our citizens to reach their full potential. But in the wake of a changing climate, after a project is completed, we can't hang up our hard hats with the same sense of confidence that we once could. At this uh, inaugural session of the International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, the question we face is not just how we achieve progress, but how we can protect it from the worsening disasters of a warming world. At the front lines of the climate emergency, achieving resilience is deeply personal for every Fijian. Stronger cyclones, heavier floods, longer droughts, the looming threat of sea level rise, you name it, we have faced it. And we know these impacts will intensify before they ever abate. In 2016, Category 5 Super Cyclone Winston made landfall in Fiji as the Southern Hemisphere's strongest ever storm. In 36 hours, the value of one third of our GDP was wiped away. 44 lives were lost. 40,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, and 350 schools were flattened. Amid the rubble, it was painfully obvious what must be done. While we were powerless to single-handedly change the severity of the storms that we faced, we focused on what was within our control, the power of planning. We knew we must summon the will, the resources, and the expertise to build back better. We realized quickly it would not be easy. There are no shortcuts to disaster readiness and resilience. It is a long journey that we make every day with one foot in the present and one foot in the future. Because for progress to have a permanence, we must keep our gaze fixed on the horizon on those storms yet to come. By planning and preparing for infrastructure crippling disasters before they strike. Take building a school, for example. Traditionally, a government would simply weigh the cost of constructions against the benefits for students and the community. But extreme and unpredictable weather has forever changed that calculus. Now, we are faced with unprecedented considerations about how we build, what we build with, and where we build. We have to ask, will the building codes and plans produce a school that can withstand Category 5 storms on a near yearly basis? Can it double up as an evacuation center for the community? Is the soil dense enough to support the infrastructure despite heavy rains? Are its lines of communication disaster proof? Is the building site too near to the eroding coastlines or too close to a cliff that could uh, potentially slip? And as the climate keeps changing, more complications will follow. Needless to say, every new question adds dollars and days to the construction process. But as someone who has been to the opening of many cyclone resilient structures, I can tell you, the effort is well worth it. This past December, 32 of the schools that we rebuilt from Winston lay in the path of another Category 5 superstorm, Cyclone Yasa. Every one of them is open today. As our roads, health centers, and other essential infrastructure that we build back to better, more resilient standards. Meanwhile, our rapidly strengthening disaster readiness has led Fiji to become the first nation to achieve target E of the Sendai framework. Our early warning systems played a huge role in shepherding Fijians to safety and avoiding the same catastrophic loss of life we saw from tropical cyclone Winston. 
We owe that success to the whole of government effort we've uh, marshaled to build resilience. We mainstream adaptation into our national planning, ingraining climate-centric thinking across all aspects of government decision-making. We have developed a national adaptation plan, and we have a groundbreaking climate change bill in the works that mandates that government agency reports on how disaster risks affects its infrastructure assets. But despite our progress, the climate is still changing faster than we are. Cyclone Yasa is only one of the 12 serious cyclones that have followed on Winston's Hills since 2016. Rising seas have put more than 40 Fijian communities in need of relocation to higher ground, and the banks of our 45 major rivers are breaking under the strain of torrential rains. During our most recent cyclone, Anna, Fiji saw more rain in 24 hours than the city of London sees in a year. The scale of action Fiji requires is startling. Together with the World Bank, we've conducted a climate vulnerability assessment that puts the cost of climate proofing Fiji's development at $9.3 billion over 10 years a daunting figure for a nation of our size. But we know the costs of inaction are far, far higher. When a bridge is washed away by a surging river, you lose more than the cost of that investment. There are communities that uh, relied on that connection. People who travel that bridge for work or to reach essential services are now cut off and cast to the margins of society, creating compounding costs that we can never hope to calculate and must do everything in our power to avoid. It is past time that the global financial system shares that recognition. Right now, development finance is still being allocated as if the world is still at pre-industrial temperatures. Finance is not available nor is it accessible to climate vulnerable countries at the scale we so desperately need. That gap is wider than ever today, as tourism-driven economies like Fiji's have been decimated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank my friend, Prime Minister Modi, for India's leadership to ensure nations recover together from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our efforts to strengthen disaster resilience depend on it. But longer term, we need systemic reform to our multilateral system that properly values the long-term benefits of resilient infrastructure development. Whether it is a seaside Pacific community, a South Asian uh, metropolis, or farmland across the Mediterranean, we are all at the front lines of climate-driven disasters. And we all stand our best chance at building resilient infrastructure by working together, learning together, and acting in unison. This conference is our opportunity to bring a more resilient world within reach. And we owe it to the people and to each other to meet this challenge with the urgency, the resources, and the ingenuity it demands. Thank you.